Welcome to Two Cents FC. I'm your host, Amobi Kugo, back again with my guy, L. Each week, we'll be talking with individuals from around the soccer world, learning about their stories and getting their unfiltered thoughts and opinions. This week, we'll be talking with former pro baller, he's still a baller to this day, sports analyst, storyteller, and entrepreneur, Rodney Wallace, uh, one of the most respected guys in the game, uh, one of the most fun guys in the game, let me just say that. Uh, we'll be getting to know all about Rodney, his career as a player, and learning about his off-the-pitch endeavors. Uh, Rodney, how you feeling today? Bless, 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 bless. It's uh, it's nice to be here with y'all, L, Moby. I mean, I'm happy that you guys are are in this space with the podcast, with the team. Two cents, you know what I'm saying. So, thank you for having me on, and uh, just just uh, ready to educate alongside y'all. Now, respect. It's long sure, overdue. Pleasure. It's Facts. long overdue. All right. So, so let's jump right into it. You know how we kick it off. Um, two truths in a cap. Mm. Rodney tell us three True. facts about himself. Two will be true. One will be a lie. And Moby and I have to guess what the lie is. So Rodney, whenever you're ready, go ahead, man. Um. Okay, let me get this started. Then this is how y'all wanna. This is how y'all wanna jump off. So let's do. I led DC United um, in yellow cards during my rookie season. I was selected by the commissioner to the All-Star game in 2013, and English is my first language. Oh, what y'all wow. saying? Where was you want me to repeat them again? Nah, I got you. I yeah, mean, I know you're you. Costa Rican, so English probably, it, it's probably not your first language. Um, you didn't find out well, I don't know. Oh, until he wanted to play the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> what? Are you, but El said maybe. So how are we? Are we answering questions and maybe? No, no, we're not. We'll no, no. I'm, 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 I'm working through it. I'm working through it. We think out loud. Okay. Think out loud. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Ooh, hostile, hostile. Just like he was on the field. That's how I know the yellow card is true. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Um. I think it's uh damn, where was the All Star game in 2013? Because 2012 was Philly. Like, was it Because he is, nah, he was fan voted. You were popular. You were hella popular around the time. I'm saying um, English is the lie. I'm gonna okay. go on a limb and say the All Star is a lie. Fair enough. That's actually. I feel uh, like you were out the question at some yeah. out of the country at some point. Not not that. I did yeah. my research, bro. He wasn't out of the country then. You did your research, L. <laughs> but, so, I, I, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, guessing. I, yeah. can't, I, can't, I can't go look it up. You know what I mean? So I got it. Yeah. No, it's all good. So the facts are did lead the DC United team in yellow cards. <laughs> and uh, Spanish is my first language. So hey. that was the cap. Oh. And then, and then uh, the 2013 All-Star game was in... Dude, I don't even know, but I didn't go, but I was selected. <laughs> okay. So I'll those are. Uh, I'll just take the game bonus, but I'm not going. Is that what you do? I'm, I'm cool. It's okay. I can't. <laughs> I, I can't complain. <laughs> because usually you get selected. Obviously, you go, you play. Yeah. But then you have, uh, fans select fan selection, and then you have the commissioner's pick. So that season. Uh, we had Portland, we had Portland popping 2013 yeah. with Caleb Porter. So that was a very fun year. And I think that once Caleb came, he really allowed me to, to polish my game. So 2013 was a very good season for me. It was a very good season for Portland in general. That's when Portland kind of went to the next level in, yeah. in my eyes. When Valeri, Valeri's first year, um, having Ryan experience, Ryan Johnson up top, uh, Will Johnson, just players that we never, I never expected, for example, to play with Will Johnson. You know what I mean? And he yeah. was, he's, he was one of those dudes that was always on, yeah. on, on the field, but he was like that in training, but off the pitch, you know how that goes. Those dudes off the pitch, they turn into a completely different person. Yeah, exactly. I guess they become, I guess they become themselves. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. So obviously, you know, you hit your stride, I guess, 
because you always, I mean, you came into the league playing every game. But before all that, there's a backstory. When did you originally fall in love with soccer? When did I fall in love with soccer? I think that the passion for the game for me came early on growing up in Costa Rica. Literally what I would see is my neighbors playing on the street, right? Like setting up two rocks, um, seven, five feet apart. You get the rock, you count the steps, put the other rock down. That's your goal. Go to the other side, do it again. And every single day it was like, five on five, whatever it was, whoever wanted to play, they could play. If you weren't nice, you would have to wait. Um, And in my eyes, when I would see that, I thought that I was at an appropriate age to jump in. And I did every single time I, I played. And those dudes in Costa Rica, I'm from Desamparados, Costa Rica. Those dudes really brought me up. They uh, like the, the neighborhood legends that we call them, right? Um, the hood stars, those were in Costa Rica, they were ballers. So I looked up to, to certain, certain neighbors, certain, uh, certain guys. And, uh, my game came from that, the, the chip on my shoulder, always trying to, um, the, play the mind game with the opponent and just that, that fierce energy of, of having the, the base be fitness, bro. How, how do I learn that, uh, eight years old you know what i mean so they had me out there just making sure that i was legit and the neighborhood kind of protected that so they everyone really wanted me to to be the one that made it so it was dope yeah it was it's no i love that you bring that up you talk about hood you know the hood ballers you know in 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 the states you know you got the ogs but you brought up a great point where they pushed for you they protected you and you see that a lot of times when it comes to in the States with basketball and football. So growing up in Costa Rica and then obviously, you know, living in the DMV, talk about the differences when it comes to that youth development in the inner cities or in the environments where sports might be a, a career path. No, that's a great question. And from my perspective, coming from Costa Rica, to the United States, seeing it from a a football perspective, I came in not knowing, not, not knowing anything about how they played here in the U S what I knew was going to go after school, going to play, um, in the street before doing, I, I would do my homework, go play there. But then I, in a club level, I was, I was in a high. I was in a good position. I was with the uh, UCR, which is University of uh, Costa Rica. That was my club, and it was competitive. But then it got to the point where I started to to get better, and so that's when I had the opportunity to go to La Liga Deportiva La Juelense. and literally I trained two times, and then that's when we found out we had to go to the states. So came to the states. We were driving around and I see lacrosse goals and I didn't know what lacrosse was. And I was like, mom, like, don't tell me that these are the goals that they play here in America. You know what I mean? So I was, I was worried about that. Uh-huh. So my mom, my mom found a club team on the newspaper ad. She cut it out, called the coach. I went on a couple of tryouts with Reebok sne- sneakers. I had no cleats at the time. I was slipping all over the place, but made the team and that completely changed my life being on the Potomac Cougars as my first uh club team was if, it's if, one of the reasons if why I know about the Potomac Cougars ask about them. one of the best club teams in all of you sports during Rodney's time in real life facts <laughs> facts I heard, about them, I heard about them from California they used to be yeah, on the got soccer right. boards and stuff <laughs> <laughs> you definitely used to go check the soccer boards to see how they were ranking you huh this After guy, the tournaments he, and stuff. He's, he's not a top 10. <laughs> nah, so with that being said, you talked about, you know, settling into the States. How was it, um, you know, being Afro-Latina in like the DMV? That. How was that for you? It was a blessing. And at the same time, it was a blessing. You know what? I can't even say, I can't put a negative on that 
uh -huh. because it's what happened and it's, it's how I grew up. It happened and things happen and I can't take those things back. So growing up in the DMV, Afro-Latino, I'm black everywhere I go, Yeah. right? So you would never know that I speak Spanish. So I'm black wherever I go. Black people are black people wherever they go. So we get treated as black people everywhere, right? Yeah. So then I have the Spanish side, being from Costa Rica. So then it came to the, the point where I was able to blend in with the Latins because I wanted that comfort. Yeah. And then also I wanted to be in that space of black people because my whole family were black, bro. So I connect yeah. with black people. I felt comfortable with them. I felt comfortable with Latinos. I could speak Spanish in school. So that was for me the 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 point where my life changed was when I realized like, whoa, I can I it's a wider range. I can speak in English, I can socialize in Spanish. It, it's that was when I really saw the big picture, like, oh, there are communities here that you know, they're from El Salvador. There's a community here from uh, Honduras. So then that's when I started to realize what the DMV had to offer in, in those ways, which is the DMV is very diverse. It's yeah. it's a lot of a lot of Latin people and obviously the the black community. But I still faced a lot of the, the same things, the hardships that y'all faced when you were 10 years old in, in your states. I no. lived with that in Costa Rica, so yeah. No, it's crazy. I was just always intrigued by it because soccer is the global game, and I feel like you fit that. You know, Afro Latino able to connect with so many different cultures within the soccer space, but then also feel the effects of growing up, maybe being the only Afro Latino on your club team. Luckily, DMV is a little bit different when it's when it comes to diversity, and obviously mm. knowing your your club team Potomac, y'all had uh, a diverse team. But I just wanted to get it from your lens of what that looks like. Um, yeah, because the I, mean, yeah, I didn't even I didn't even answer the question, bro. So from a club perspective, it's <laughs> I didn't even answer the question because you were about to get to it. But it was exactly how you how you said it. Um, we we had four black dudes, five black dudes on the on the team, but we started to realize that. So then we started to get our our boys in. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like yo. Come, come, come ball with us. So okay. that's how we would, uh, that's how we would approach it, man. But yeah. we, I was very blessed that Maryland was, Maryland was a spot for Latins, for black people. So, and obviously you continue to develop and you chose to stay close to home. Why Maryland and why do they continue to stay good to this day? Thank you for acknowledging that we are better than <laughs> Akron. Well, I didn't go to Akron. No, hell Where no. Where did you I go? UCLA. That's I right. UCLA. I yeah. That's right. So, no, yeah, we was... beat y'all. We beat... You wasn't there. You was already pro, but we beat y'all first game. So, the hey, opening. You, but you, game but you already, you, you you know why, right? You took, you guys took advantage of that, that whole group, the whole group left. You <laughs> said, you know what? Right now, they're, they're easy pickings. But no, Maryland's always been good, and I love that. Um, I love that. I love that about Maryland, that it's a, it feels like a professional environment. Sasha Sarosky is the reason why that that program is ran the way it is. Mm -hmm. You can get consistent um, fans, 8,000 consistent fans. If it's sold out, I'll give it a 10, 10K, which is beautiful because Sasha understands what it means to, to have people support you or have people boo you. But you yeah. experience that early, which is which is good. I went to Maryland because I was a ball boy. I used to go to the games and I used to like hand the ball off to Chris Lankos, uh, Jason Gary, just even, um, he, I, I went to, I went and I saw Mo, Mo do. I really? saw Mo play and I was like, bro, like this place is, is the truth. So growing up in Maryland, all, all you wanted to do was go and, and play there. You would go as you would go with your club team. You watch like maybe a half and then you'll go play. But, Maryland was the spot and there was no way that I was going to go to any other school. I did the whole thing where I would, uh, I would, I went to visit, I went to the UNC's, I went to, to Duke and it wasn't it for me, but it was cool for my friends, whatever. But I was like, yo, I'm going to Maryland. So 
ended up committing to Maryland. Um, and the rest was history from there. I really enjoyed my time. I stayed until my sophomore year. And it's a, it's a good place because Sash cares about the player. So the classroom, yeah. the football, nutrition, all of that, it's all covered. No, that's what it's all about. Can you talk about it? Obviously, you know, you've had a splendid career. You do some stuff with MLS Next. You went the college route. For the young player that wants to follow in your footsteps and they're thinking of a pathway to follow, why college? Why not college? Is it about finding a program like Maryland? What like what would you tell them? No, nah, that's, a, that's a good point. I think that there are a lot of players right now in this day and age that are really good, really good, a lot of potential. And sometimes they are influenced by people that don't want the best for them. They just want the best for themselves. Um, we're talking about agents approaching a 14 year old and approaching the parents. Maybe that 14 year old isn't, uh, doesn't speak that much English and his parents don't speak that much English. They, maybe they came from a certain lifestyle and it's intriguing when you're, you're offered a contract at a young age, but not everybody's made for that. And I've re being with uh, MLS Next Pro, it allowed me to really, really see that. The fact that you have players who just aren't ready, you're not ready for that. Yeah. And then you have the players that are already signed with pro teams and you can, you can tell why they're signed with pro teams. But it's the understanding that there are many different paths and you know this, you know, going to college, Going to college for four years, that's okay. Go to college for two years, three years, but it's up to the player. But the decisions that are being made behind you have to be made by a certain circle. And that's why the people you are around are, are so important. I went the college route because I wanted to get that experience of, of growth. If I would have gone to Europe, I had the opportunity to go to Hoffenheim at 18 years old, but me personally, I wasn't ready. And good thing my mom was like, go to Maryland, get your degree and all of that. Ended up obviously leaving my sophomore year, but it's just a different route that I took and it was professional for me. And, and when I was there, players would talk about staying at Maryland. I wanna, I wanna be the captain my senior year. I wanna win another national championship. But nowadays the younger players, all of them want to go pro because yeah. their friends are going, they're signing a contract. Their friends are signing a, a bad contract, but it seems like, you know, you sign a contract is a big deal. Yeah. And then now parents start to compete with each other. Like my son should be this. My son should be that. My daughter should be this. It's a, it's a vicious cycle. It's just all about potential too. What if he turns out that, what if the player turns out not to be good, but that's what it is now. Football is about potential. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And then obviously you, um, turned your potential into a contract. You went GA originally to DC, so you're able to stay home. Um, but you talked about that transformation. Obviously, you came into the league, started off well, but once you got to Portland, that's when you started to be like a household name within the league. So let's dive into that 2013 season and, you know, how is it a springboard to national team? championships, mm. you know, all the things that you were able to accomplish with your career. So being from DC, going to University of Maryland, playing for DC United, those were beautiful things like hometown hero. Um, I lived that life that was that many people dream of. And I, I don't know if I respected it enough when I, when I was younger. Obviously, looking at it now, I'm like, come on, man. Like, I went to Maryland. I went to D.C. Like, that's that doesn't happen often. Mm -hmm. So after I, – and I got comfortable. That was the problem. I got comfortable. I was hurt, broke my ankle, uh, 2010. And it was just, like, me hanging around. Uh, my friends that still went to Maryland, um, going out instead of uh, just do, doing the proper rehab, just not really taking it as serious as I could have taken it looking back at it. But Ben Olsen was my teammate 2009. Then he became my coach 2010. After the 2010 season, he brought me into the office, traded me straight to Portland. 
And he was like, bro, this is the best thing that's going to happen to you. You have to get out of D.C. You are... I played every single game, uh, 25 games out of 28 for DC United 2009. So I was making an impact. Yeah. But Ben saw my, my, my decline with injury and not focusing, coming to, to the, coming to, to, to the training room, not in my best shape, going hungover or this and that. And that was the, that, that was the part that I wish I could have been better with I'd say but going to Portland and being on my own being my own person having to live by myself not have a roommate that um that I would rely on or he would rely on me to to go through um every situation as a young pro I lived with Chris Pontius in DC so that was fantastic to have somebody the same age the same yeah. we were, same draft everything so I didn't have that in Portland but it was my turn to be a footballer and I went to Portland didn't know what to expect fans were fans know you in the street you know in DC it doesn't happen that often but being in Portland you know how it goes it's it's like hey what's going on they want to shake your hand or they, they don't even want to take a picture they literally just want to say thank you which is incredible so that was the best move um that I ever <laughs> was was forced to make going to Portland being on my own 2011 expansion year stadium packed 25,000 Timbers army I didn't know what that was stepped on the field for a preseason game place was jumping no. so then I was like okay I I'm starting to understand it these are real fans they're supporters there's a difference between supporters and fans right and uh we grew from that. We grew from, from 2011, from having no idea how to run things. So we had, they, they, Portland had people in the club that was, that, that was their first time being in the MLS, right? So they were operating on the, um, on the so yeah. yeah. So then uh, I show up and I'm still giving laundry on the loop and stuff like that. And I wasn't used to that. You know, you're used to having your stuff folded and ready for practice. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, I'm always, you always had a new pair of, of Adidas in your locker for every match oh, day. this guy. You know what I mean? So it was different for some, but that was what it was. So then we were able to help each other. Like, yo, this is how I've seen this being done. And this is how we can get better at this. Then 2012 came. We were not as good. 2013 came Caleb Porter changed the whole vision of what the club should be like and that's when things just started to climb now we start to get the kitchen the facilities the 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 nice gyms and and the 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 training center the recovery all of that stuff started to come in and that's when you start to see okay and like they're investing in us as players Let's deliver. Let's deliver. Yeah, okay. So it was special. We had a we had a good group. But the best thing that could happen to me was being on my own. No, I think you you hit the nail on the head because earlier you spoke about how players sometimes aren't ready. They need to stay in their comfort zone. But you were in Maryland the whole time, so maybe to get out of that comfort zone, that's what helped you blossom. So trying to figure out your balance as a player is what it's all about. But as a pro, understanding like. I'm competing with the kid, 30 year olds that have family members and like I'm competing with people that came out the slums like they 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 send in their money back it's not even they, it's not even their money they're sending their money back home so under the, understanding that as a young pro makes all the difference and uh, obviously you used to hate playing against you cuz you run all day oh my goodness uh no, but it's because you you kept nobody could take the ball from you bro you shoot it like this you were playing like Patrick Vieira out there bro it was it was unbelievable to see this, bro. <laughs> so, so it's it's great to see like when you went to Portland and obviously you were a big part of their success. How that transformed not only Portland as a club, but uh, obviously the trajectory of your career. So, talk about winning in 2015 uh, after Nagby. It went out of bounds. No one called it. Take it down the line. Cross it to you. You score. Talk about that experience. <laughs> It's okay. The ball was out of bounds. Like it, it really is okay. This is uh, a question that, or a comment that comes up a lot. 
Uh-huh. And shout out to to Kai Kamara because he's really upset about it to this day. <laughs> there's not there's not one time if I say hi to him, he's like, "Bro, you stole that from me." But <laughs> it, it's, it is what it is, right? The uh-huh. ball 2015. We started out uh, average. Um, then we went into from average to to not good. Then we went from not good to in a very bad position of not making the playoffs, and then. I remember the the core group that we had. And by that point, I was in that position where I was the bridge between the, that I would say the older guys. And then, then there's the younger guys. And I was at the position 2013 where I could vibe with both of them. So players felt comfortable having that communication. Sometimes dudes don't speak Spanish or any yeah. sort of Spanish or any other language. So then the, the the Latins feel a certain way about it, right? And it kind of goes both ways, but we had a good group. We had a, a good balance. And having players like Nat, Borchers, bro, um, Diego Char is still there, Jack Jewsberries, um, Liam Ridgewell, just, just players that have, uh, Valeri, just players that have been in that situation. They have been there in those locker rooms. So having that special locker room and being trusted, it, it goes so it go it went a long way. Yeah, I feel like you're the linchpin to, between the old and the new, between the domestic and international, and like you said, a, a great locker room goes a long way. You know, we see it in the league today. It doesn't so, matter about all the talent. Facts. Yeah, exactly. And then 2015, that was uh, the ball was out of bounds. We played Columbus. MLS Cup, we got to MLS Cup because we sat down and we just, we said, what is it that we want to do? Do we want to pack it up? We have 10 games left. Pack it up and start booking vacations or do we want to make a run for this? It'd be a waste of time if if we don't. We still mm-hmm. have hope. We did it. Ended up going to the championship. Ball was out of bounds. I think Nagby played it to, to uh, Milano. Cool. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, Milano. Yeah. And then Lucas is like, I knew he was about to cross it. I just we we had good chemistry, even though people believed that there was beef between me and him, because people would create friction and people yeah. create stories because of what they feel they saw. So Lucas Milano was supposed to come in and and take my spot or whatever. So being young, I always had that like this guy mentality, like yeah. It, so, but it was a, on the field, it's the complete opposite. That's your brother on the field, you know what I mean? So I knew that he, I knew how he played. We knew each other. Dude's on the right, gets the ball and just sees me just making that back post that the back post has always been a thing that I take pride in defensively and offensively. Facts. Made the back, made the, the, the run and he just put it in the, on a, on a platter right in front of the goal. I just dove in, headed it. I don't, I, it was like 12 minutes in something like that. And then mm-hmm. that was the second goal we scored in 17 seconds. So doing the 17 seconds, 12 minute, it just, it was like a, like a knife for, yeah. for Columbus, but the ball did go out of bounds, but the dogs, will keep playing until the referee calls it. I don't exactly. care what you say. I'm going to try to do what I have to do to to get my way, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's what it is. I don't care if there's VAR, if there's four referees. If you're playing and you want to dictate the game, those, those are things that I'm going to do. And that's what they say when it comes to, like, understanding the dark arts. And obviously, growing up in Costa Rica, playing with the Hood Stars, that's things, those are the things that you learn. And a lot of times coaches will talk about how we play in America, we're too nice, you know. Oh, out of bounds, everyone stops. It's like, no, you play until you win. Um, yeah. And obviously you guys won 2015. And this is like now Rodney's top of the top. Part of the Costa Rica national team, obviously you moved to NYCFC. And then you even dabble with a little bit of overseas experience in Portugal and Brazil. So talk about those experiences and um, how it was like once you reached that high level that you reached. This was a, another part of my career that was a turning point. So I won the championship, 
which was, I mean, to this day and every day that I, that I wake up, it is uh, a blessing nobody's going to be able to take from me or my family. But I went on to, I moved on from Portland and I went to Portugal and I thought that the grass was going to be, was going to be greener. And I left out of me thinking, I left out of ego, me thinking that I, you know, I'm supposed to go here now. I'm supposed to get this money that the deal didn't get done. So I'm not signing until I get this amount of money. It's, it was kind of ridiculous for me to, to not take that contract and just to like explore Europe in the winter window, Mm -hmm. which is hard coming from the MLS, no matter how well you play, no matter what it's, the winter window is, is tight because you go to a club to enhance it and you have to, you have to fit into that energy. And I went to, to Portugal, I went to Aroca. The team had just been in the, in the first division. They were fifth on the, on the table, small town team dreams to make it to, to Europe, to UEFA, to champions league. I came in and I was, I was in the outside early on, like the coach didn't bring me, you know, it was a move by the GMs and the presidents uh, to make money. Coach didn't even know that this, this dude was coming from the MLS, but I could play. So the, the players respected that early on and the coach gave me a chance. Um, early on the, my first game we played, uh, I think we played Porto and I'm, um, I'm stepping into the stadium, bro. I like go up the stairs and I and I see the stands and I'm like, okay, like I'm in I'm in Europe, like fantastic, this is it. After that, bro, I don't think I played any games. I think I played one more game, and uh, I think that was against Braga at home, and Brazil came knocking on the door. They were like, hey, look, um, we see that you're not playing as much. We've been looking at you since you were in Portland. And that was actually uh, a conversation from the club to me. They were like, yo, they've been trying to reach out to you. Like, talk to them. We know that you're not, you're not at your best over there because we were trying to figure out how it could come back. But they're like, go, go see about this opportunity. And it turned out to be one of the best opportunities as well for my life. So being in, in Aroca, having to survive cold, don't speak, wow, I didn't speak Portuguese early on. Mm-hmm. The, the clicks, you know, um, competition, because I'm coming to take somebody's spot and, and then they feel a certain way and he has his friends that feel a certain way. So I was on my own. I was on my own, just just grinding. We'd, go, we'd get back to the hotel, cold, sometimes just crying because I'm like, bro, what is it that I'm doing here? Like, where is my career going? And those are the things that were just making me stronger. And then I went to Brazil and I already spoke Portuguese. And... It was uh, it was my turn to say, you know what, like, I'm taking all what I've learned and bringing it to Brazil, to the hot weather, to this different environment, to Joga Bonito, <laughs> and and it was it was beautiful, bro. I blossomed there. I, the things that I learned playing in that league, unbelievable. Um, I had cool experiences going on the field versus uh, Gabriel Jesus, Robinho, um, things like that were like huge to me yeah. and I was performing in Brazil I was I was playing for Recife at the time and it's a historic club and fans over there are, are different they're they're active in the sense of like they'll throw rocks at you or they'll like wait for you in the lot they'll throw whatever at the bus if you're not performing type type of place but I put in the work bro I, I earned my stripes with that with the city with that state, I would say in Brazil, and to this day, I uh, I'm one of their uh, one of their guys because they're not that many foreigns. I think there you have like four or five foreign spots, mm-hmm. and for a foreigner to go there and then perform the way I did at left back, it was it was dope. It was dope. No, I love it. Uh, and obviously, you had the wonderful opportunity. Not many people get to have it to play in a World Cup for your home country. Talk about that experience, and then if you have a craziest story from that experience. In the world cup. um the world cup was was special it's what you yeah. what i was what i would watch that would fill me up the most within the game of, of soccer like passion wise 
So I remember watching Brazil France the final. I remember um, Roberto Baggio missing that PK versus um, Brazil '94, and those were things that I would watch and I, they give me goosebumps as a young kid. I want to be there. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I have a ball. I have a dream. And no one's going to stop me from wanting to be a doctor and a soccer player. I always told them that. And then ended up going 2018. Russia, it was special. I couldn't believe that I was on that airplane. I couldn't believe when I saw my name on that list, even though I expected to be on that list, you know, because you already talked. By the time the list comes out, you already know. Exactly. So just like having that, but you still don't know, right? Because the conversations are conversations until you see your name on paper, Doug. So I saw that and uh, I I took it in. It wasn't like I jumped and I was excited. I was like, okay, there's still more work to be done, right? So from that point on to getting to the World Cup, it was friendlies, it was training. It was, you have a, you have a training camp and you have fitness and you have to get over obstacles. Everyone's competing. In the list, they're, they, the, he, the coach picked, I think, 25, 26 players. And I think you only, t- well, you only take 23. And so I was starting to be in a position where I'm like, okay, I have to climb over all these people. And I was like, why am I doing that? I don't. Like, I have a, I have my, my, my spot. I have a, a certain, th- a certain skill set that I bring to this team. And so I started to just focus on that. And like, how do I con- get back to cracking that 11, get back to being in the, in the 15 or 16, get, get back into the, the, the 18. And I did, bro, Start, like focusing on myself and what I brought to that team was, 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 was good. And then we got on that plane to, to Russia, got there and it was just massive. Things were just massive. So being in that stage, the new stadiums, the, the atmosphere, having your family right there in the stands, I celebrated my 30th birthday in Russia at the World Cup. Incredible, incredible, incredible. No, you can't, you can't beat that experience. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Costa Rica is in a unique time frame, one of the premier clubs in CONCACAF. Uh, what do you think they need to do to continue to be a powerhouse in the region and um, continue being uh, one of those? The national teams? Teams? Yeah. I think they're going to be in, in a good position now. Um, they're in the World Cup. They have uh, their group is, I believe, Japan, Germany, Spain. And I love that. They love that because the underdog. Costa Rica has been the underdog ever since they stepped foot on on the pitch. So being respected because being respected in CONCACAF, that's that's true. We are, uh, we're strong in CONCACAF. We're strong at home. We rarely lose at home, but the respect still is not, still not there. Mm -hmm. So we, we take that personal and, and seeing this group go from where they started in the qualifiers, where there was like a 6% of them making it to the World Cup to winning every single game, um, the last the last qualify, qualifying window to go to the playoff spot, I knew it was going to happen. My wife was like, yo, there is no chance anymore. And I was like, oh. like, yo, everybody. I was like, yo, you guys don't understand how much, what they're doing inside that locker room to get yeah. to where they want to get. Went to Qatar, played against New Zealand in the playoff, won it. Now they're going to the World Cup. Now they're supposed to be in the group of death, which is fantastic because now they have everything to to prove to themselves. They don't. It's not about the fans or nothing. They're in the World Cup, so now they're just gonna ball. They're gonna go ball, and then the combination of youth, leadership, that connection finally clicked. There were times when. It was divided, and I think in Russia that was why we. That's why we didn't make it out of our group. There was a, there wasn't that cohesiveness. But now I see it in their group. I'm not in their group, but I see it. Because I feel because I'm. We're, I just left the game, and those guys are my dudes, bro. They're my guys, so I know exactly how they operate. So, them being the the new the next generation, Francisco Calvo, Joel Campbell. For example, 30 years old, 
those are the new leaders. You'll see the car, the captain's armband on those guys after the World Cup. They're going to lead a generation of, of younger players that are blossoming, that are now in Europe, um, that are getting ready to to make big moves. Jew, Jefferson Bennett, a player that never played in the first division, the coach called him. To, uh, I think he's 18 years old. The coach, the national team coach called him, Luis Suarez. Bro, he was the one that gave Joel Campbell the assist to go to, to go to the World Cup. So having young players or confidence that, that are being put in in, in, in extreme position. position, right? You can't that 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 means that the next generation coming in, like the next cycle for the U.S. World Cup, is gonna be strong. I love it. No, most definitely. I want to circle back real quick um, to talk about your time playing in Brazil. You mentioned like the fan culture is crazy out there. So what's, what's one of the crazy stories that you could tell about your time as a player? Like one of the situations where you're like, oh shit, I don't think I'm gonna make it out of this or it's looking kind of dicey. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, that's, I even uh, get... Oh, that might have to be for the Patreon. You don't know, Ronald. Hey, hey, hey L, you got a little bit of, of Nagby in you, bro. I have, to t- I have to let you know. You got a little bit of Darlington in you. Oh, that, that chill energy, you kind of, y'all got that same, uh, same energy. Just had to let you know. Um, sure. I don't know how you want to take that, but you definitely got a little nagging. Nah, re- respect. Like, I, 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 <laughs> right? It's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. it's a great thing. So Brazil, a situation that got sticky. Um, oh, sticky it gets. I knew you were about to say that. Um, <laughs> there were a bunch of them. There were a bunch of questionable situations from being in my building. And having fans come to take pictures of my kids playing in the pool, stuff like that, that was, that's when you start to build like some sort of like who's watching type environment. Mm-hmm. Going to losing four games in or losing four games or three games in a row, madness when we were trying to leave to the bus. Dude just threw a rock, shattered the, the, the front of the bus. And then from then on, the fans just went nuts. The bus was shaking. And it wasn't like a good shaking. It was like they were really out here trying to trying to take our lives, bro. That's we ended crazy. up winning like the next two. And then for the playoffs, the, the places, the streets packed uh, with fire, uh, red flares and all that stuff because now they're supporting us. So that was the balance in, in Brazil, like either really good, really bad. And we had to stay underneath the stadium one of the in one of the classicos because there was a man that I think passed away getting beat up from because he was supporting the other team. So we were watching it on on YouTube in our locker room what was going on upstairs and we couldn't go up. We couldn't go up. Those are the games you couldn't take your family to. Yeah. Not even in a in a box or anything. It's just sticky for real. Yeah, now I've heard stories about like just South American soccer in general like it's, it's, it's kind of good to get like a first hand account you know what i mean yeah but it's like come on man that's not even like why enjoy yeah. the game i i can't understand if we're playing spades or dominoes or something and i we get we start talking shit yeah but come on bro like you really are here killing people because they have a tattoo of a certain club yeah, we gotta get over that we gotta we gotta stop yeah, it's, it's never that serious but all right, I don't want to damper the mood. Let's 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 switch. No, gears those, a those are real. Those are real <laughs> things, bro. That we want to talk about and people want to hear. So for sure, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so throughout your playing career, you know, obviously, you know, being born and raised in in Costa Rica, moving to the states, then you know, playing MLS, moving over to you know Europe, coming to Brazil, like you you know you're well traveled. But all, but throughout that time, you know, you've been doing analyst work. Um, so what made you want to channel like your second career energy towards media? Um, it was 2014 when, so I tore my ACL in Portland. Last game of the season, Real Salt Lake, Tony Beltran and I go into a, uh, into a tackle. He has more, I had, I was on the sideline trying to get a ball. So he came in with his, all his weight. I, my leg wasn't able to take it. And tore my ACL. It was devastating because I wanted to get to the 2014 World Cup, and I was getting getting called. So that's another another turning point that just allowed me to grow. But 
it all started 2014 because I was in, uh, recovering from the injury. And then uh, the local show, Timbers and 30, they were like, hey, do you want to come in and do a couple of games now that you're hurt? That was like GM, actually. Gavin Wilkinson was like, why don't you go and do some games and, and you know, learn a new skill or whatever it was. And at first I was like, come on, man. Like, what am I going to call the games here? And I opened my eyes up. I went and did it, put on the suit, went and, and got in front of the camera struggled a bit at times i felt super comfortable then i was able to to do three four five i got to do like eight games and then from then on i said this is something that i am that is growing on me it's not something definitely that i love but it's growing on me so then we fast forward into let's say 2017 mls caused me to go to the studio we were knocked out of the playoffs so then the, the semifinals were, were available. They chose me. They, they allowed me to go in and, and be a part of the studio. Susanna Collins, um, Kaylin Carr, and myself just being in the studio, talking about the playoffs. And that was another opportunity for me to see what it was like, experience the lights, the camera, uh, all of that focus that you have to have, the, how to deliver the message. And you start learning from that. Then once I retired, I started to to gravitate towards that. And it was CBS that called for um, Nations League. Nations League. Uh, so it was in an international tournament and Costa Rica was playing. I felt comfortable talking about Costa Rica and other um, national teams within the region. So it worked out for everybody. And then from that, I did Gold Cup with... Um, FS1, which was dope, with having to work with Alexi Lalas, with with Stu, with Rob Stone, just the just the big players right now in the game, in the broadcasting game, and that's that's the truth. They've been there, they're they're doing it. So I looked at myself in that same lineup, and I said I have to take advantage of this opportunity, and I stayed on. So now I have the pleasure of being with Fox in Espanol, Fox Deportes, which is a beautiful thing. I can cover MLS, I cover Liga MX, and it's just a learning pro process, but it's a beautiful thing to go out there and be able to talk about the game in, in a, I wouldn't say just a positive way, but from a player's point of view. And I'm not a, I haven't been doing this for, for 10 years, but I gradually see myself getting better and better and loving it more. So as a player, having something that you 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 feel passionate about after you're done playing is is so important because we we operate on passion on the field. We operate right. on our on our passion. So I can't operate at a less percentage in the real world because I won't get the same results that I got as a player. Nah, that's dope. Um... And you also, you know, you got your pen game up as well. You know, you've written, written a couple articles. Um, so which one do you enjoy most? Like, is it on camera work or is it writing articles or a little bit of both? Well, I think that last, the last two weeks, some, uh, something that just clicked. You know, you have those moments where you're like, ah, that's a moment of growth. And I'm keeping that, I'm keeping this feeling and that, that whole pattern that just happened. I yeah. had that. And like you said, I picked up the, the pen, right? So now that I, I've always loved writing, now I'm writing about the game, I'm writing about whatever it is, just sit there and just type and create stories and all, all of these things that I, that I love. And then all of a sudden, MLS calls and they're like, we want you to do this. And, oh, you have the opportunity of writing. So I did it, but I was already in that space internally. Mm -hmm. So it just made sense. So now you start getting paid for something that that you love again, but I'm not playing anymore. So it's like, okay, that's an add on. And now those, that writing has now turned into, into writing that, that can be used for anything. Writing can be used for everything. And I just realized like, okay, I can write scripts. I can write a uh, exactly. whole show. I can write other people's stuff. Yep. I can write for other, uh, publications, uh, it's writing has become 
just a, a train that is going to allow me to step into different windows if I continue to do it properly. Because I remember not too long ago, I sent in my, my paper to the MLS. They sent it right back. Like, this this isn't uh, up to the standard that you have. And then we had a conversation. And I loved it because they were like, telling me what it, they tell me the truth like this wasn't good enough let's talk about why it wasn't good enough and for them it wasn't good enough for me mm-hmm. I loved it right but for them it wasn't good enough which is okay you're not we're always we're gonna get rejected and we're gonna use that as an opportunity to to move forward but they didn't like it he talked about the environment of writing and things that I didn't know that professional writers do and that was like, bro, that's just an eye opener. Like, if they don't like this article, maybe I send it to to this other magazine, for example, or media outlet, and they love it. But it's okay, because your your articles or your movies, your your things aren't for they aren't about other people. You do it for yourself, and if they like it, they love it. It'll be published. So, I've tapped into the fact that writing is allowing me to to go places further than i could ever imagine yeah. so it's all about Not for sure and i'm gonna yeah. shoot my shot too you know bro i'm right for two cents fc as well you know we got a platform for you you have a, a full platform you down two yeah. cents like a full platform that you are creating and you're not waiting on anybody to create for you like yeah. that's what people want we want to see that you're able to do it before i put my two cents into it if you guys want to accept their two cents, you mm-hmm. know, because yeah, nah, it's, come it's rock yours. with us, man. So, yeah. I'm here right now. We, we, we uh, here, baby. And I bro, know we need more than we two got cents. We've seen your content. <laughs> <It's the DP. laughs> no, 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 no. I might, you, you want to talk about, you want to talk about DP? All right. Anyways, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> now, nah, but like kind of staying in that vein though. So you, you know, you've, you, you've worked with the Stu Holdens and the Lexi Lawlesses, like traditional media, Fox, CBS. Um, but then you're also, you know, having conversations with us as independent media, like new media, if you want to call it that. Um, where do you see like, black the media, media too, game bro? Going? Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Black for sure. media. Where do I see the 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 game going? Yeah. We're the owners. We're the owners. We're the creators. They're looking for us. We we've been knocking on doors, like talking about knocking on doors. I personally have knocked on doors. I've learned about how to knock on doors, correct? I've mm. I've been in that world because I don't play anymore. So it's a whole different uh environment and the way that people perceive you as a as a as an athlete, as a black athlete, as a just a soccer player. It they actually try to at times i felt like they've tried to give me less because i am just a player right like they want uh they want players but then they don't want to give them too much because they think that they're not good enough or they have to earn something like let's work together give me something that i (laughs) give me something that is going to allow me to say okay i'm putting my my neck for this so Operating in the space of, of, of your own studio, your own media, um, representing communities. I represent the Afro-Latino community, the Latinos. I, I support what everything, I support everything that the Black Players Union is doing as well. But it's for us, it's for us. Let them come to us. The doors that we knocked on, they are now, oh, they're like, we, they're, they're closed. Or halfway open, but now they're like, "Yo, wait, what are y'all working on over there? What's 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 going on?" Yep. Right? They now they oh okay, so now you want to tap into to to this, but it yeah, was up to us check. to yeah exactly. It's up to yeah. us because we've been giving them the checks. All your ideas that you've pitched that you've given somebody, you see that doing it, and you're like, bro, like that's that's what I got to start doing myself, so they can come and say, I want that, and you tell them. It's not the same price, bro. It's not the same yeah. price. So yeah, I'm really happy that you guys not today's price. Exactly. Yeah. It's and that's why I'm happy that I'm that I'm on this on the show. Honestly, I love what you guys are doing. 
I see who, how you all are moving. I saw you guys at MLS, the All-Star game, and I, I was happy to see that you were out there making the necessary moves to bring up bring up the two cents, right? But keep keep it at two cents. Keep it at two cents. Let them bring the let them bring the the rest of, if you want. But mm-hmm. do your own thing. Let them come. That's that's what I learned. No permission necessary. Go do it. Then they'll want it. No, I love that. Sure. I'm still in that quote. That, no sir. permission necessary. That's a bar. For what? That's a bar. <laughs> because that's that's what you started to do, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I have to ask them to, for me to be on their show. Come on, man. Like, I was born creative. Mm-hmm. I was born better than than a lot. I've experienced uh, a lot more hardships in a small amount of time than a lot of people. You guys have all seen different things that are massive that people will never see in their lives. Create, mm-hmm. so now like that's your creation. Yeah. Yeah. Building our own tables. Like speaking of being creative, talk about, you know, this no permission necessary. You've done brand deals. Obviously us at Two Cents, we're continuing to figure out ways to do partnerships. Talk about your experience working with these companies as an ambassador and any advice that you would have, you know, in this content driven space now, this creator space where you're seeing brand deals happen. It is a, it is a a lot of, there's a lot to be done if you move wisely as a, as an athlete or as whoever you believe you are. These companies have have money. These companies at times are no. It's just, these yeah, companies have talk, money. Yeah. They are they're looking for you, and at times they don't want to give you that money. But start doing things. Start doing things. Putting yourself out there. A lot of the time, those opportunities that comes from brand that come from brands, it's not always going to be the the figures you want to see. Sometimes it's it's free, but. You need to build a bank. You need to build your tape. You need to let people know that you're even doing that. So then once it, it, it gets stronger and stronger and you start feeling more comfortable with it because you can't say yes to everything, then brands start to see how you move and then you start to see what brands you like to work with, what products, what you can get, what you can give this company. And and that's another thing. It's how can I help you? What can I do for you guys? Why don't we start that conversation like that, right? Because obviously there's some sort of synergy there because they want to work with you. How can I, after doing the photo shoot or doing uh, the appearance, how can we take this further? How is there a way that we can continue to build on this because I'm now passionate about your project and keep it keep it moving? At a young age, we didn't have that mm-hmm. growing up. Like we did appearances because our team admin would give them to us, but like, I'm not going to say any brands, but a phone company is now coming up to kids. You're 14 years old, 15. Like now you need a team to start telling you and putting these things in, in your brain. Y'all need, they need the, they need to hear the two cents. Like realistically, they need to hear things like that. No, it does. All right. So Ronnie, we was talking about like, you know, different opportunities that athletes have. Uh, you're someone that's doing a great job, not only for yourself, but your family big checks, big deals. Uh, So walk us through this ambassador life. Like how does one land a deal? You know, obviously we are at two cents. We're trying to get some, we're trying to get some of that Rodney magic. So what does it take to, you know, land one of these deals and talk about that ambassador life experience? Like what makes you choose one from the other, the negotiation process, the whole, the whole shebang. What, What is it about? Hey, you know what I like about, the the podcast you know what i like about two cents is the fact that y'all really be sliding like you think you're slick, <laughs> sliding in these little comments <laughs> Yo, yeah. can't, fool, can't fool me bro i'm i'm still doing that <laughs> yeah, we gotta get him in when we can you know i like that i like that small jabs but reality though you're speaking truth or not you know what i mean so anyway yeah uh deals so at first when i got introduced to being a brand ambassador or uh, posting this in exchange for money or product 
I was new to it. I was, it was like 2000, what, like 13, 14, 15. And I was like, bro, what is this? Like, I'm supposed to take this picture with the product or whatever. And then as I grew, or as I grew, I, I realized like, wow, this is an opportunity for me to actually connect with somebody within the company in a, in a way where we can take what we just did, this photo shoot with this product. And now how do I get it? How can I help the company grow? For example, when I was in Portland, uh, I'm over, you know, Amy Zinskin, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the home. So yeah, that's, that's, that's the link, right? So she was with the Portland Timbers while I was there and she hooked me up with a pretty good deal, with a really good deal with a, with a banking company. And it, I, I was intrigued, first of all, because it was a really good um, appearance. Uh, it was uh, coming from Amy, which is she's she's good peeps, she's family. And so I trusted it, right? Because some of these appearances that we get are not even about, they're not about the money. They're more about what the opportunity is, like what opportunity is there after that? So Amy gave me that, that appearance and it was dope. It was with a credit card company. And then after that, I was like, Amy, after, uh, can I get so-and-so's contact within the company? And then I reached out. And then so we started to work on, on separate things away from anything team related. So after that, I kind of started to realize, okay, there's, there's money in this. Um, that's just another source of income for an, for an athlete. And at the time I didn't really, I didn't have a, uh, my own business. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, let's see like what I can do in, in within this. And it's really about your personality. Cause I, for, I, I was shy about it. You know what I'm saying? I was shy mm -hmm. about putting myself out there too much because I didn't want people to, to think I wasn't playing soccer and, or I wasn't focused enough. And fast forward into now, it's like, if I was my younger self and I had the opportunity to capitalize on on brands that i support that i do the research on before i even um respond to the email mm -hmm. right so you do your research if you align with with what they are doing if you believe in the in the product or you believe in the person which is a lot of the times it's about believing in 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 people then then go ahead and, and try to figure out how you can make the most out of a brand because a brand will offer you a certain amount or product to do something. They might have more in the back end, and you might just do it for that amount of the amount of money that they set, even though, you know, you, you, you deserve more, you always rate yourself higher, but you do it. And then you go into that, you vibe with them, with the company, and then you make the connection away from that. So, when there's an opportunity to be somewhere or to you're introduced to somebody or there's uh, a product or, or a service involved that both parties can benefit from, it's really about networking and, and figuring out what I'm best at and what my best can bring for them. And if it's, if the synergy is there, then it makes sense. You never know what kind of deal you, you end up making. Not most definitely. Has there been a favorite deal that you've done to date? Nike was, was, was fire. The Adidas was obviously generation Adidas was, mm -hmm. was everything. Cause it was my, I mean, generation Adidas, that was, I think that was my first check before I even got paid by the league. <laughs> That's tracks. Yeah. Right. They gave it to us during <laughs> waiting, December before we even go to the combine. Hey, where's yeah. my money at, bro? <laughs> And so, back back then, that's when they was giving serious deals, you know. And Ronnie Wallace out coming out the national championship. You got, that was, you got you got a big deal. You actually one of the you got paid the most out of the all the generation of people. Nah, right? see, nah, this is this it is was you. Jokes. I think it was you. Nah. Uh, Omar Gonzalez got nah. you two were, were the highest paid. Not even. No. How do you come into the league making four hundred k already, bro? You're see, you're... Uh, I'll cut that because that's not true. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would make a lies. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, nah, but I think it was after now nah, for real, like all talks all jokes aside, I think it was after year year they were like, Oh, these young players are getting paid too much. You got the players union complaining. 
guys, Ronnie Wallace, Omar Gonzalez coming into the league. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now nah, we're keeping all this. <laughs> Turning my shit around me. <laughs> but, but so this is what's funny when it comes to the league. And uh, real quick, real sidebar. When it's like a blessing and a curse for a players union. And obviously it's a good estimate. It's never the exact amount. But when player salaries come out, the jokes start flying. And uh, for guys like me and Rodney, we're jokesters within the locker room. Uh, it's a good time. So, so a lot, a lot of heavy checks. A lot, a, a lot of, a lot of heavy checks. <laughs> so, so it's all good fun. No counting pockets yeah. here. But how do, you, how do you feel about that when they put the salaries out? First of all, they're not always correct. But okay, you're right, exactly. Yeah. But how do you feel about that? Ah, uh, it's it's a blessing and a curse. Obviously, like if you're like a player that's doing well, you want to have like a barometer to negotiate against because if i'm like say i'm like walker zimmerman in the league now the best defender i'll just go to my agent and be like yo anytime player salary comes out if i'm not the highest played defender then you just need to be knocking on nashville's door because there's no way like someone can't just come into the league and be leverage yeah so it's good for leverage but then it also makes the locker room awkward when it's like yo homeboys not playing what's going on here like and it just creates how that make, how is he making this and he's not playing bro yeah, yeah. and you never want to like you know pocket watch but it's like at the same time it's like you might have to talk to your agent like how is this it's agent a, it's a it's a real world it's the yeah. real world bro like exactly people gotta you, eat you know you what are, I mean? you are you are what you negotiate i think the biggest thing is when you know because there's conglomerates when it comes to agencies in the league when you have a four or five six seven guys from the same agent on the same team and like the playing levels equal or whatever. You got some guys making a little bit more and you're like, yo, I thought you represented me, but you represented everyone else on the team. So how you, mm -hmm. you telling me to take a pick up and you giving it to them? Like, so that's the whole dynamic that I always talk about offline. Uh, but that's a yes. great question. So yes, 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 you, yes. What you think about that? I mean, it doesn't need to be publicized. I think, yeah. I think that information will be available to us regardless. If you yeah. wanted to get it, we can get it. You know what I mean? Exactly. But there's no reason why everyone's like non-bonus salaries are in there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like Exactly. It doesn't even make sense because it's just what they're taking out of. They're not, they don't know the contracts. They're just making Thank like you. the assumption. The big, yeah. Exactly. Cause you got guys making Every goal they score is twenty thousand dollars, you know, just to give you a little insight. And that's what the two cents uh, podcast is all about. Like, you're not you're not seeing, we you're not hearing what we're talking about, you know. Yeah. So you, you got you know why people fight over PKs is because that that goal bonus is fifty k. True. <laughs> so true. I'm not I'm not letting you take this free cake, buddy. I'm sorry. I'm, this is my this is mine. Yeah, um, but it, I don't. I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. It might seem like a big deal, but from the inside, we know, like, yo, Mans is going to take this PK because he's about to get this check, and he's going to take it, <laughs> yeah. and he ends up taking the ball and taking it. Exactly. Or, like... And, every, and you already know why. Exactly. Or when a player gets iced out towards the end of the season, and you're like, wait, what happened? Like, he's been playing? Yeah. Well, yeah, if he, if he reaches 20 games this season, then his contract next year is guaranteed, and it's a $100,000 kicker. So, yeah, the coach Think might out. say, oh, he's, like, injured. Nah. His contract stuff. So when we got fans doing think pieces of like, oh, this is my best 11 based on salary, like, you don't need to. I got a question about that, though. Is the salary yeah, list something, is the salary like that. list something no, that's unique to MLS? Because I haven't heard about that happening like in the Premier League or any other league. But imagine if that happened all over the world, bro. Like, people, it would put players in danger. So yeah. if <laughs> somebody that, like, back home, Think, well, sees that you're making this amount, and it's like, oh, I'm gonna ask him for a favor, or I'm gonna ask him for money, or I'm gonna go and focus my energy on how I can yeah. get something out of this person. Like, it's public knowledge, bro. So everyone yeah. thinks that now you are, or they might know. So it's it, it's not necessary. But anyway, no, you bring up a great point because there's been a couple of MLS players that have gone back home specifically to Argentina and have been in situations. Because, you know, you count pockets. Yep. So, 
Um, nah, that's a great. We might have to do like a case study episode on that. So Ronnie, the robbery, rob, robberies after the salary comes out. <laughs> oh no, no, just, no, just oh. like <laughs> just dissecting like like the inner workings of contracts and stuff that uh, people yeah. don't see on a day to day basis. Um, but we talked about brand deals, obviously, for you and your family. Uh, your beautiful family, but let's talk about you, you, you taking a brand to the next level and starting your own business around it. You're talking Rewind by Wallace. So Rewind by Rodney Wallace. I like that. Thank you for introducing it. It's a um, CBD company and we've been growing it in a way where it's THC free the main, our main products are THC free, so they are locker room friendly. Not everybody wants to to have uh, psychoactive experiences. Some people are there for pain, the anxiety. So, no THC makes it e- makes it easier for players to trust it as well. Like mm-hmm. it's coming from me. Okay, uh, I I can I can see it. Like I'm gonna try. It. That's that's oh that's Rodney's. Okay, oh there's no. There's no THC. Okay, now I can feel more comfortable. Now the, the trainer is like, yo, send me some of these. Let me try them out. Yeah. Boom. Then the players like it. And then so it's like, yo, let me order this, this, and this amount. But we made a product for everybody. But there there's a selective group that we wanted to specifically just target. Oh, and okay. and, and that's, that's the, the, the athletic world and the world where people want to – you go work out because you want to achieve something. So here's this product that's going to help you get better mentally, physically. No, I love it. So talk about like from idea to like execution and then the, like some of the lessons you learned on your entrepreneurial journey. So we had the idea in 2017. Once I started to feel pain, um, my wife found it in New York. She was like, let's try this out. I tried it. It worked. I was using it um and learning about it and then i was hiding while i was using it because i didn't want people to think that i was out there just um high on the field or something because of the stigma and i was educating myself at the same time i knew that i wasn't doing anything bad but still so then i kept going you was the one during uh during the drug test uh waiting running to the end running (laughs) running back and forth (laughs) Yo, why haven't you gone home? <laughs> it's, 7, it's 7 p.m. Still chugging waters. Unbelievable. Oh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so where were we with that? Because My bad. You know, I had to get the jokes in. I know, uh, bro. You, you was talking about, you know, the entrepreneurial journey. Of, oh, you know... so we, we started in uh, 20. We launched in 2020. Literally January 2020. Pandemic hit. And it was our, our first challenge. So we come out with rewind pandemic hits and things are just uh all over the place and we're we have a company to to grow so we didn't let that stop us we actually found the ways in which let's use that to our advantage since it, we're new to this how can we now use this to our, our advantage like, we were born in rewind was born in an era of destruction bro like covid so we had to really survive and it was looking at it now is the best thing that could have happened as an entrepreneur is like suffer for, not suffer but go through the hardship first like the the mm-hmm. chaos and the noise and then how do you remain calm and actually try to help people while that's happening and then educate and then collect but it's a uh, it rewind and then the pandemic was so, like it wrapped all it wrapped together just it, that energy was was perfect and yeah. and what i mean perfect like yes we lost a lot of people but a lot of people were able to get helped um mm-hmm. depression anxiety there were lockdowns um people had trouble sleeping so all the anxieties of people being like um kept in a room or things or having those feelings CBD helped them and Rewind was, it was cool because I would get emails or, or texts like, yo, appreciate you. I'm having a hard time, like with this isolation shit, like bless. So that feels good. No, I love that. What's the favorite part about like business in this space, like product, uh, outs- like uh, sourcing the materials or the products, or is it the marketing? 
Is it like the scaling operations? What like drives you? Um, obviously, you, the founder CEO, you have to have hands in everything. But is there a certain lane that you like gravitate towards? I I believe that I something recently just like clicked. You know, people talk about their passions, and yeah. when you are passionate about something, then that's when you start to see the money because people do things for money at times and yeah, that's fine, but it might not be for the long run and that's okay. Like it's like playing soccer. Some people play for the checks some people play for the love of the game, mm -hmm. same thing. But I like to approach it, like I said, in a long term uh, scale. So it's really just, how can I put it? The process of it, right? So I, yeah. I found that my passion is soccer. So how do I turn soccer into a business, bro? You know, right. like how, and I'm passionate about it. And then I just started to, to really tap into that instead of shying away from, from the game or why, why not build plant seeds in my community with the game and let that grow. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how everybody wins. And that's also business. People forget that helping each other is business. So Thanks. it's a way of everybody growing, but it's your passion. So you're going to put a hundred percent in, you're going to bring people joy and it's just, everybody's growing, everybody builds. And then someone's like, yo, I want to get into this project with you. Like my son loves soccer or yo, I, I've been coaching for this long. I want to be a part of this. So then you got to love it. You got to love the process and the, and the, not the losses, but the lessons, Moby. Tell them about the lessons, bro, because yeah. I feel like we don't take we don't take L's, right? Like, when's the last yeah. time you said, man, I took an L? Like, you wouldn't let yourself get to that level. Never. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So use everything as, 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 as a way of growth, lessons. Just there's no way that I can look at a situation in a negative way because then I won't be able to then I'll stop and I'll, I'll, I'll jump into the next thing. It's like, no, you got to get over that hurdle, bro. Like, it's okay. There's a reason why the hurdle's there. Let's solve that problem and keep it moving. Like That's all these perfect. kids these days can, they can play every video game and solve every single, uh, open every single door in the video game, find every clue. It, like you have to work to do all that stuff. It's just like that, bro. You have mm -hmm. to get through the adversity and just, Move forward, bro. Everything is there for you. You just got to learn how to figure. You got to figure out how to how to get it. Yeah, yeah. that's great advice. And then you you talk about you know building a business from your passion of soccer. Uh, you've done Rewind by Rodney Wallace. You're doing the brand deals. I know you're doing a lot of um, broadcasting, soccer consulting, different things like that. What's next in the Rodney Wallace conglomerate of business ventures? So Rewind started as a CBD company and now Rewind has shape. It's, it's, it's a growing, it's a growing company. It's a growing brand. So instead of making it just CBD, now we're allowing it to be a lifestyle. So now we're in the, in the sports, but like really out in the sports, right? So now we formed a, a futsal team. We played in the in the Surgeon yeah. League. Um, Dom, the me, the yeah. shoes. No, bro, because you weren't never you were never in town, and I asked you, and then you try to tell me like, bro, I'm not gonna play. I'm not gonna pay to play. Blah blah blah. I'm like, bro. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely added this shit. This <laughs> video, we gonna have to get L on the edits. <laughs> I can't okay. pay to play, bro. You crazy. Um. Hey, the season two though. The season two. So the market's open right now. Um, let, I'll trials. talk to your agent. Whatever. No, okay. no, 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 no. Uh, no trial. We'll just you know take a look at how you're feeling, bro. Yeah, most definitely. Get him on there. You, haven't, been, you haven't played in a while. Yeah. You're you're not fit, but you know what I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get you in. <laughs> so yeah, we started the the team, um, and then that's like okay, wow. Now we have a team. Like we can take this team and and let's say play in any tournament, not any tournament, but we can, let's say travel worldwide and we want to yeah. play in different tournaments as a football team. And then now it's like, let's build a, a hub, right? So why not look to, to build a space that matches what Rewind is about? So now mm -hmm. we're talking like the recovery, all, all that stuff is, that's, that's passion. 
and it's just like building blocks. So just build, bro. Just build. No, I love that. I definitely. You looking to do any content around that? Uh, we'll, we'll we'll get we'll get there. We're, we're good. Us three, we're sure, good, sure. bro. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> the process, the process, we're for good. sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, I see your I see your music headphones though. You want to talk about that? Did you are you investing? Oh, ooh, we can talk about that offline. Nah, my funds <laughs> okay. is not like that. <laughs> but I could get I could get a couple get a couple of brand deals by just by association every now and then. Okay. Uh, good still out here you're, you're capitalizing on that <laughs> yeah most definitely. by the way how do you capitalize off the podcast like do you want to give us an insight into how that works because people well, athletes think like going on a podcast you're about to you're about to do it you're about to make it like it's that's it's, it's crazy it's time and we could talk about that because i know we don't have it in our show notes but you had a podcast with 1 p.m 37 with the boy ethan white uh, yeah. shout out to ethan doing some good things i know uh, we're gonna have to get him on the podcast so you know he's hella secretive, but we're gonna, yeah, get him bro. On. He probably, um, you're, if we had time chance, because he'll be in Italy or Morocco. <laughs> so, talk about from your perspective, and then me and El will give you ours for the audience as well. Um, bringing a podcast to life, and then like the kind of the different mechanisms around potentially making money and then scaling it to an actual show. Because you always want to start off as a podcast, but then you want to transition it into a show. You know, got to think bigger than just a podcast. So, Originally, you know, first five, ten episodes, we were like, yo, Two Cents FC podcast. And then L came around and was like, no, we're a show now. And obviously we have a, a conglomerate of our family under the Cultureverse. You know, shout out Shea Butter, shout out FCC, shout out um, all the other entities within the ecosystem. But um, from your lens, what does it look like bringing something to life with a big platform like 1PM37? And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll share our, our take. So... Uh, attaching yourself, you can do it independently, or you can use help or use a, a a platform that is going to get your voice out there to more people. And we were blessed to have a good connection with One Three Seven. They wanted to run a podcast. Um, it was Ethan White, myself, uh, Paul DBA, and we talked about the game, the culture. We talked about fashion and we talked about all these things, but then like it got to a point where I think Ethan and I realized that it's, it wasn't what we personally wanted to do completely because you know, there, there are show notes and this is what we're going to cover. You have a meeting on whatever Wednesday <laughs> to make sure you know what you're covering all of that. Too right? It's not just, yeah. yeah, it's not just logging in. And we're like, there's a lot of these things that we don't want to talk about. I, don't, I didn't want to talk about Arsenal, like, for 30 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like, there are real things that were yeah. happening. So it was a great experience, super blessed, because we got to feel that. And we knew what it, we now know what it's like to to be in a podcast, to have a podcast. Um, and super grateful for 137 and everybody that was a part of that, the production. We did a bunch of shows. I think we got to like four or five episodes, maybe three. Um, mm-hmm. But it was a blessing because uh, it, it taught us what we want to do. Like we want to be more hands on into our content. And that's what we are all on. Just owning our, our content, owning everything. Yeah. I'm going to do it right here, right now. So if anyone steals this idea, <laughs> it's on you, Rodney. We're doing yep. we're doing, we're doing a two cents collaborated with Rewind by Rodney Wallace. We're going to bring Ethan in from I Am Athlete. We're going to do Rewind by Wally, by Wallace. You're going to go around the world, interview athletes on the best... No, 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 no. Keep the idea. Keep the idea, bro. <laughs> chill, 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 chill. Chill, This is not public yet. It's not nah, public yet. We're not live with it. I'm just Don't telling you right now. This out, though. So okay. then, yeah, no, I see so when this go, So when this goes live, we're going to be like, yo, we've been talking about this on the podcast. I like that. I like clip. I'm just I putting like it out there. So, you want to be on? Oh, oh this yeah. is this is the the real one, the rider. Yeah. She, she's got her own business. Oh, dope, dope. So, her and her sister make bracelets. Oh, wow. That's and, and necklaces. So, <laughs> you're What are you doing, bro? <laughs> 
<laughs> Why are you spitting on the show? <laughs> um, but yeah, I appreciate you for having me. Um, obviously, I got to bounce, but it's been a pleasure. There's more that we are going to do from here on, but this was a good taste of of what is to come. Uh, I love cool. it. Can we get you for one minute? We're going to do rapid fire real quick, and then we'll do close it out on our own. What's one interesting fact about yourself that most people wouldn't know? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down. Uh, Rapid <laughs> fire, but I can understand it. Go What's on. one interesting again? fact about yourself that most people wouldn't know? Um, That I speak Spanish. So if, if somebody's in an elevator and they're speaking Spanish, they're talking something about me, I can respond in Spanish. And it's... It, it, it blows their shook. mind. Yeah. <laughs> All right, dope. I love right, it. What's on your pre-match playlist? Uh, pre-match, I think now I'm in a state of my life where every morning I get to, I don't have to feel like I have a match, but my, my moods and my, my vibrations change. So right now I'm waking up playing a lot of, uh, okay. Thames. We are playing a lot of uh, the Harry Styles album. You love it, right? Yeah. So we've been we've been jamming out to Harry Styles. Dope, it's been dope. a proper album. What's your favorite song? She has her favorite song. Boo, what's your favorite song? Tell him. <laughs> this is by Whisk Kid. <laughs> you don't need no other body yeah so the whiskey album the whole thing rides by the way so shout out to Wh- uh yeah to whiskey for that um the new burner boy new burner boys on fire so that's where i'm at right now in regards to to music i wake up i want like the sun is out and a lot of the african music is is it's just healthy about good vibes and, and the energies right and it's more than just your your surface music. For sure. I feel like good it. for your energy. All right, last one. What's your favorite country to play right. in? That's very rapid. Yeah. My favorite country to play in would be uh, Costa Rica. I love go. I used to, when I would go there for for the national team camps. There's just a different feeling um when you get to the training center and then when it's friday night and you got to play a game versus the u.s the stadium is is lit people are banging on the bus there's nothing like it so dope, dope all right take it away Moby. my wife is over here uh my wife is over here uh yelling at me because she loved it in uh in brazil in that environment in recife it was madness so shout out to to my people from recife um, they really held it down, bro. They really had, a, they really held it down for us. Um, it was a year of growth for me, so I definitely have a lot of love for that club. All right, last question. I want to just jump in real quick. What's your secret to being loved by the fans? You've been a fan favorite everywhere you've gone. Obviously, it's I've been a energy. villain too. Oh, really? It's always, it's I've always. Bought, it, it's a, it was a love. It was a love, love, love hate. and then like. And I wouldn't say hate, but we, we, I feel like me personally, I had a, I wasn't playing well. So I felt like it was somebody else's fault. So when I would see something on Twitter, I was like, like oh no. So yeah. then I just had a host, I had a hostile feeling towards, I guess the fans because they needed, they wanted more from me. And I was like, whatever, but, but it's about being vulnerable with your fans. And that's how, yeah. that's how you gain respect from, from people by, understanding that your performance wasn't good they are not going to lie they might lie to you and say good game but like they can say they're they can they can make their own opinion but i think that whole fans and players thing is is a sticky situation you can be involved but you can't be too involved with then now they feel like they're your family because then it's all twisted but being a fan favorite it's just really about being in the community just community first no most definitely You've always done cool. a great job of it. You have to as well, which is dope. MLS yeah. works. Yeah. Yeah. Then take us out. All right. Thanks, Rodney. We really appreciate you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to get to connect. We're excited for the endeavors. We know we got we got a show already <laughs> pre-scripted that we're going to have to launch. 
Uh, but that's our show for this week. Subscribe, rate, you gotta, review it. You gotta, you gotta set deadlines too. You know. Oh that. yeah. Almost oh, definitely. You got, you gotta have deadlines. If if not, then it don't even work. You might as well not even bring you gotta it up. Have deadlines. Yeah. Good. So good, good, good. It was a <laughs> pleasure know, being here. No, nah, most definitely. So, uh, subscribe, rate, and review. It helps us get discovered. It helps us continue to get wonderful guests on the show. Follow us on the socials at Two Cents FC Show and tweet us your comments on the show. Any topics you want me or L to discuss. Once again, Ronnie, thank you so much. We're going to have all his information in the show notes. We're going to have his link to Rewind by Rodney Wallace. If you're trying to, you know, relax, if you're trying to get some better sleep, if you're trying to recover, we're going to have all that. So make sure you show trying support. trying to work out. Yeah, work out, uh, good vibes, whatever you need. Make sure you check in the show notes to support the Two Cents fam, as well as what we got going on. So with that being said, over and out. And we'll catch you on that later day.